How did a political friendship that brought Scotland tantalizingly close to independence descend into such rancor? The bitterness of their feud makes high drama. This is the dis dysfunctional relationship between the two most important people of the nationalist movement, Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon, who are now mortal enemies. But the personal clash exposes a bitter political divide in the SNP, upon which the long-term fate of the UK hangs. For it's a dispute about where the independence project goes next. So Nicola Sturgeon's historically very important to the country, to the SNP, and we have to get behind her and get behind uh, the future of the country and unify as a party. In March last year, Alex Salmond was on trial, charged with multiple counts of sexual assault. Nine women gave evidence against him. Alex Salmond left the High Court, an innocent man acquitted of all the charges against him. By now, he was convinced that he'd been the victim of a deliberate plot to destroy his reputation. And he said the evidence would soon come out. Evidence that I would have liked to have seen led in this trial, but for a variety of reasons, we were not able to do so at some point. That information, that facts, and that evidence will see the light of day, but it won't be this day. Now it's the Scottish government he once led that's on trial. Mr. Salmond has told the inquiry in writing that there was a malicious and concerted effort by Scottish government and SNP officials to remove him from public life, even to the extent of having me imprisoned, he said. He accuses Nicola Sturgeon's husband, the SNP chief executive Peter Murrell, of trying to persuade staff and ex-staff members to submit police complaints against him. In January 2018, the Scottish government began an investigation after two women civil servants complained about him. In March that year, Alex Salmond complained that the investigation was unfair. He wasn't given the chance to defend himself. The Scottish government carried on regardless. So he brought his case here, to the law courts, and won. In a process known as judicial review, the Court of Session found in January 2019 that the Scottish Government's handling of complaints against Alex Salmond was unfair and tainted by apparent bias. The Court ordered the Scottish Government to pay him more than £500,000 in legal fees. It was a staggering defeat for the Scottish Government, revealing incompetent and even unlawful conduct at the highest levels. The current Holyrood inquiry was set up to examine how the Scottish Government got its internal investigation so badly wrong. At his criminal trial, Alex Salmon's defence counsel, Gordon Jackson, went further. There's something going on here, he told the jury. I can't prove it, but I can smell it. Evidence for whatever it is he thought he could smell is what Alex Salmond hopes to bring before the Holyrood inquiry. And if Gordon Jackson couldn't prove it in court last year, can Alex Salmond prove it now? He says that the Scottish Government had been given explicit legal advice that it would lose the Court of Session case, and it went ahead with it anyway. That's a very serious charge. Secondly, he claims that a special advisor was heard saying they wanted to get him, uh, which also is a, is a fairly serious accusation. But probably the worst is that he says very categorically that Nicola Sturgeon has not told the truth about meetings she had with him prior to all this in 2018. And that, if you like, could be the worst uh, outcome for Nicola Sturgeon. What did she know and when did she know it? Nicola Sturgeon told Parliament that she first heard of the complaints against Alex Salmond at a meeting with him at her private home in Glasgow on April the 2nd, 2018. She did not inform her civil servants of that meeting and no minute was taken. But a former chief of staff to Alex Salmond told the criminal trial last year that he had told Nicola Sturgeon about the complaints three days earlier at a meeting here at Holyrood, a meeting she later said she had forgotten. In which case, why did she agree to meet Alex Salmond in private and keep no record of what they discussed? Alex Salmond says she has repeatedly misled Parliament on this and that this puts her in breach of the ministerial code, an allegation she denies. Many claims have been made about me. There are legitimate questions that I have to answer. I am rightly and properly subjected to scrutiny. Uh, but he also has a, an obligation, if he is making claims about conspiracy or plots against him, to not have that as assertion or smear or uh, insinuation, but to bring forward the evidence of that. And that's his opportunity to do that this week.
Thank you, Convener. Alex Salmon's decision to delay his appearance comes after he raised questions about the inquiry's credibility. The Crown Office, Scotland's public prosecution service, intervened this morning to block publication of some of Mr Salmon's written evidence, limiting what he would be able to say as a witness after raising legal concerns. The head of the Crown Office is one of the Scottish ministers and is appointed on the recommendation of the First Minister. Mr Salmon's supporters say this amended publication of his submission amounts to silencing him and denying him the redress he is seeking. Ruth Davidson of the Scottish Conservatives told Parliament there was a cover-up orchestrated at the heart of government. The whole affair has shone an unforgiving light on the governance of Scotland, the openness and accountability of its institutions. In his written evidence, Alex Salmon says there has been a complete breakdown of the barriers between government, political party and prosecutors, barriers that are essential to any functional democracy. I have to say the Scottish Government have been incredibly obstructive. We need to get to the bottom of why the Scottish Government lost the judicial review, why they brought forward a flawed policy um, to deal with harassment complaints, and we don't start to get into that unless we can actually see the legal advice that was provided to the government. Nicola Sturgeon promised that the committee would get every document they asked for, all the cooperation we required, and none of that has really happened to the extent that it should have done. The Salmon Sturgeon rupture exposes an increasingly bitter split in the SNP that was emerging anyway. With polls now showing a majority sustained over many months now in favour of independence, many allies of Alex Salmon see Nicola Sturgeon as too cautious. They want a more radical Plan B for independence, one that gets round Westminster's legal right to veto another referendum. She remains popular in the party and in the country. Her handling of the pandemic has boosted already strong public approval ratings. But now her supporters feel the need for the first time to defend her not from opponents of independence, but from supporters who think she's not radical enough. This has never been a better time in terms of the mood of the country. Nicola Sturgeon is more respected than any leader has ever been. She's more respected in European capitals, which is crucial, because the whole point of having the argument is to get Scotland back into Europe, and they'll have to receive Scotland and accept us. So Nicola Sturgeon's historically very important to the country, to the SNP, and we have to get behind her and get behind uh, the future of the country and unify as a party, and I think that will happen. Nicola Sturgeon is facing a second parallel inquiry led by a former public prosecutor to determine whether she did indeed break the ministerial code. In normal times, breaking that code would trigger a resignation. But these are not normal times. None of Alex Salmon's fury has yet dented her popularity with the public. Polls suggest she'll lead the SNP to an overwhelming victory in May's Holyrood elections and that there could well be a strong pro-independence majority in the Scottish Parliament, a majority that will have promised the electorate a second referendum on independence. If she does, what happens when Boris Johnson says no? Healing the rift in her party and securing her own leadership of it will depend on how she tries to answer that question.